Good morning. My name is John Whitaker, and uh, I have one word for you this morning. That word is Melchizedek. If you've been around church much, read your Bible a lot, maybe when you hear the word Melchizedek, you've got some ideas of what in the world we're talking about. Maybe you're curious. Maybe you're like, oh yeah, I've been waiting for this moment. If you're new to church and new to the Bible, you're like, what the heck is Melchizedek? Um, and so today we are going to look at all of Hebrews chapter seven in the next 30 minutes. And we are going to try to do our best to at least answer some questions about who Melchizedek is, but more importantly, why in the world you need to know about him. Um, that you really do need to know who Melchizedek is and why that word matters for you. And I want to uh, begin by helping you understand why he matters by looking at a picture. So if we can put that picture on the screen. Uh, you can tell from the pixelated nature of this picture that it's an older picture. This is actually my desk in Cincinnati, Ohio in about 1992. Uh, and that is my first computer. Um, that was a, a 386 SX. It had four megs of RAM. It had a 40 meg hard drive. I paid $1,500 for that. And I, I took out a student loan to pay for that. <clears throat> and I was told when I purchased it, it's all you'll ever need. <laughs> now here's the reality. All of us carry around in our pockets or our purses a, a small little tiny device, a fraction of the size of that computer that has uh, like way, way, way more processing power, computing power than that massive computer did. Like, um, that, that computer definitely was not all I ever needed. In fact, within a year, I knew I was in trouble, but I still had to get through grad school. And by the time I was done with grad school in 1995, that computer was little more than a glorified typewriter. I mean, by 1995, there was this thing called email, but it had no modem. I could not connect to the internet. I couldn't receive email. I could do nothing with that computer. It definitely was not all I ever needed. And the reality is, when we talk about Melchizedek, it's sort of like that. Not that Melchizedek is a problem. It's what Melchizedek and the promise connected to him was all about that helps us see, oh, we needed something more. What, what we may have thought was all we ever needed, what maybe in, in kind of our initial thought as human beings was, oh, this is enough for you, all of a sudden it became very clear very quickly, this is not all you ever need. And Melchizedek and what the promise about Melchizedek means is the answer to that problem, all right? So with that, Let's jump into Hebrews chapter 7. And here's what you need to know before we start reading that the author of Hebrews has been building up to this moment in Hebrews 7 since chapter 2. This is a climactic moment for him. And he's been working towards it for a long time. He first mentioned that Jesus is high priest in Hebrews 2.17. Then he mentioned Jesus' high priesthood again in Hebrews chapter 4, and then again in chapter 5. And in chapter 5, he first referenced Melchizedek by quoting Psalm 110, verse 4, you are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And then he said, now i got a lot to say about that, but you're not smart enough or mature enough to handle it, so hold on just a second. And then he goes through chapter 6, and then he ends chapter 6 by saying, and so he became a priest after the order of Melchizedek. And now we pick up right there. So he's expecting you and me to remember we've been hinting at this. We've been working towards this for like three or four chapters. And that just a couple paragraphs ago in chapter 5, he quoted the Old Testament passage out of Psalm about him. The problem is, is a couple paragraphs ago for us was like three or four or five weeks ago. And we may not remember that. So you have to have in mind Psalm 110, verse 4, as we go down through this, because that's the passage that's prompting all of this. That's the passage that says, you, speaking about the Messiah, are a priest for, forever after 
the order of Melchizedek. And so with that in mind, the author of Hebrews picks up and says this in verse 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham as he was returning from the slaughter, or maybe better, defeat or rout, uh, of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham apportioned a tenth of the spoils of the battle, was first of all, by the translation of his name, king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, which means king of peace. All right, now, all of that I'm sure is very familiar to you, right? No, the author of Hebrews is simply very quickly calling to mind and summarizing for his Jewish audience, for whom this was very familiar, a story out of the Old Testament, a story from the book of Genesis. And so let's just first put it sort of in a chronological context because most of us don't have a sense of the chronology of the Bible, all right? So let's put timeline upon the screen. When we talk about Abraham, we're talking about someone who lived 2000 BC approximately. So 2000 years before Jesus, there was this guy named Abraham. And according to the little summary we just read, he bumped into a guy named Melchizedek. And then what we're going to have to have in mind as we go through this chapter is uh, the Old Covenant and Israel's priests. So Moses picks up right about 1400 B.C. And from Moses to Jesus in 30 A.D., you have the Old Covenant, the Mosaic Covenant, the law, goes by different names, and the priests of Israel. All of that is going to be really important for this little section of Scripture we're going to work through. And so what the author of Hebrews does here in these first two verses of chapter 7 is he simply recalls and quickly summarizes this story that happened in 2000 B.C. about Abraham and Melchizedek. And he gives just a handful of key facts quickly about Melchizedek. So let's list them off so that we don't miss them, all right? So the, the mention of Melchizedek happens twice in the Old Testament. Genesis 14... Uh, that's the original story. And then Psalm 110. And Psalm 110 is the passage that's really prompted the author of Hebrews to talk about it. And then he lists off several facts. His name means king of righteousness, Melchizedek. The Melchi part, that comes from the Hebrew word for king. The Zedek part comes from the Hebrew word for righteousness. So his name means king of righteousness. Um, he's also the king of Salem or Jerusalem. His name got lengthened over time. So Jerusalem, and Jerusalem comes from the Hebrew word for peace, and hence king of peace. Um, and there was this moment where these four kings invaded what became the land of Israel, and uh, Abraham's nephew, Lot, was actually taken captive as a prisoner of war with a, along with a whole bunch of other people and a whole bunch of spoils. So Abraham marshaled his uh, army of about 300 trained men, and they went and they chased down these invaders and defeated them. And so when Abraham came back from that battle is when he meets Melchizedek. And Melchizedek blesses Abraham, like pronounces a blessing over him. And then Abraham gave him a tithe, a tenth of all the spoils of war. That's the key facts that we have in verses 1 and 2. All right? Now, remember, I told you, this really is going to matter. And what's going to happen over the next handful of verses is you've got to think a little bit like a first century Jew. And you're going to have to be able to understand why this mattered to them, and then out of that, why it matters to you and me today. And so there's one more key fact about Melchizedek that gets mentioned in verse 3, and that key fact is central to what he's going to say in the rest of the chapter. Look at verse 3. It says this. This is talking about Melchizedek. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, he remains a priest perpetually, forever. All right, now, don't get too lost in the details. It's easy to get caught up and have a lot of speculation about that. But I think what the author of Hebrews simply is saying is, read the story in Genesis 14. All of a sudden, this guy Melchizedek shows up out of nowhere on the scene of history. The story happens, and that's it. We have no record of his background. He, he, there's no record whether he comes from the right family for priests. There's no record of his genealogy. There's no record of his death. He just shows up in this moment, and that then becomes sort of like a, an analogy, a picture, like 
the Son of God, like the Messiah who would come later. And it becomes this picture of that in Jewish thinking. And so that is really going to be important, that he is this permanent priest in the story of Genesis chapter 14. So keep reading. Now, observe how great this man was to whom Abraham the patriarch gave a tenth of the choicest of spoils. All right, so here's what the author of Hebrews is going to do. At this moment, he's summarized the story. He's brought it to our mind. So now that we have it, and now he's going to draw out some kind of key facts to say, I want you to be aware of how incredible and how great Melchizedek was. And he's going to do it by using uh, kind of logic that to the Jews of his day would have been like, well, hello, duh, of course, look how incredible he is. So we're going to have to kind of track with what he's saying, all right? And so here's how he's going to show us how great he is. This is what he says, verse 5. And those indeed of the sons of Levi. Who's that? What is he getting at? The sons of Levi are Israel's priests, all right? And Israel's priests were the ones that ran Israel's worship. And they all came from the family of Levi. And they're the ones who collected the, the tithe from the people. So he's got all this in mind that made perfect sense to the Jews of his day. All right? So those indeed of the sons of Levi who received the priest's office have a commandment in the law, the old covenant, to collect a tenth, to take a tithe from the people. That was how they were supported. They had no land. And they got their support by the tithe from the people and their offerings. That is from their own countrymen, although they are descended from Abraham. Got to track with all of this, all right? So you have Abraham. Um, Abraham is the great patriarch, the founding father of the Jewish nation. He is the hero of the Israelite faith. And descended from Abraham are all his sons, which lead to all the sons of Israel. One of the sons of Israel is Levi. Levi is the family from which the priests come. And so the priests are de de descended from Abraham as well. Now notice, verse 6. But the one, talking about Melchizedek, whose genealogy is not traced from them. He doesn't come from the, the right family. He doesn't come from the family uh, of Abraham. He doesn't come from the family of Levi. The one whose genealogy, Melchizedek, is not traced from them, collected a tithe from Abraham and blessed him. Now, if you're, if you're a first century Jew listening to what he just said, you're nodding your head along. You guys look like you have blank stares, right? But if you're a first century Jew, you're nodding your head saying, oh, yeah, obvious. Hello, duh. It's clear how, how great Melchizedek really must be. I mean, like, if, if he blessed Abraham, he must be greater and bigger than Abraham. And Abraham's the best guy who ever lived. If Abraham paid him a tithe, he must be something incredibly special. And so the author of Hebrews goes on in verse 7 and says, But without any dispute, no one would disagree with this. There's no argument about this next thing he's about to say. Without any dispute, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. Right? Like, if someone can pronounce a blessing, they must be greater than you. They must be over than you. Well, who blessed whom? Melchizedek blessed Abraham, which means Melchizedek is greater than Abraham. And Abraham's pretty great if you're a Jew. He's the, he's the hero, right? He's the founding father. But without any dispute, the lesser person is blessed by the greater. In this case, now we're going to talk about the Levitical priest, mortal men, all those Old Testament priests, they receive tithes. But in that case, with Melchizedek, one receives them of whom it is witness that he lives on. Melchizedek received these tithes. He's not mortal. There's no record of his death, right? Um, and so to speak through Abraham even, Levi also received tithes, who's supposed to receive tithes, has paid tithes to Melchizedek because he was like in the loins of his forefather Abraham when Abraham paid tithes to Melchizedek. Now again, if you're a first century Jew, all of that is the kind of thing where you're nodding along, you're amening, all that makes perfect sense, right? That's hello duh logic for a first century Jew. Melchizedek is way superior to Abraham, all right? Now at that point, the author of Hebrews has summarized the story, brought it to our mind. He's drawn out the key implication showing that Melchizedek lives forever and he is greater than Abraham. Now he's ready to begin applying that 
to their life and to ours. Look what he says in verse 11. He says, with a rhetorical question, remember he's got Psalm 110 verse 4 in mind. You're a priest forever, which was written after the Old Testament law. You're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So, if perfection was through the Levitical priesthood, if perfection could have been brought by all the Old Testament sacrifices, by all the Old Testament worship, by all that the Old Testament priests did. If they could have brought perfection, for on the basis of it, the people received the law, the Old Covenant. So you have the Old Covenant and the priesthood, and they're mutually bound up together. They're one and the same, right? The priests are the ones that are charged with bringing out uh, and carrying out the Old Testament covenant. And so on the basis of it, the people received the law. If that could have brought perfection. What further need was there for another priest to arise according to the order of Melchizedek? And yet the psalm said there would be one someday. But why would have that been needed if the old covenant and Israel's priests were good enough to actually bring completion and perfection and not designated according to the order of Aaron? Like, here's Melchizedek. There's going to be a priest someday that's going to come from a different line, not the Levi's line, right? Not the line of Aaron. And if the line of Aaron, if the line of Levi, if the old covenant could have brought perfection, and that word perfection uh, can mean completion, right? It has that sense of completion. That's often the way it means. But interestingly enough, in the Old Testament... That word, when, it, when the Greek translation of the Old Testament, this word perfection, is frequently used for cleansing. The kind of cleansing that a priest needed to do in order to carry out his task and draw near to God. In other words, if the Old Covenant, the law of Moses and Israel's priests, if they could have cleansed people and brought them into completion so that they could have drawn near to God fully and completely, then why in the world did the psalmist, when he was talking about the Messiah, say, you, O Messiah, are going to be a priest after the order of Melchizedek? There would be no need for a new priesthood if the old priesthood was good enough. And so the very fact of that promise implies that they recognized the old covenant and Israel's priests weren't all you ever needed. They weren't enough. And let me just tell you, as a pastor, I've talked with enough people who, who feel unworthy of drawing near to God, who feel dirty, like I, I, there's no way God could ever really love me. If you knew what I had done, if you knew who I was, I, 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 no, I'm too dirty for God, Right? And what the old covenant did by daily sacrifices, weekly sacrifices, year after year sacrifices, the author of Hebrews will draw this out here shortly. What the old covenant actually does is just reminded you that indeed you don't measure up. You aren't good enough. There's a way to, to, to be right with God, and it's called animal sacrifice that the Levitical priest did, but it reminded you every single day, every single week, every single year, I need another sacrifice. I need another sacrifice. I'm not good enough. I don't measure up. Instead of actually providing the cleansing and the completion that we needed so we could draw near to God feeling free from guilt and shame. And if the Old Testament law and if the Levitical priest had solved that problem, you would never have a promise that says, guess what? There's going to be another kind of priesthood. And it's only going to have one person ever occupy it. It's the priesthood after the order of Melchizedek. And so the author of Hebrews goes on and says, for when the priesthood is changed, of necessity, there takes place a change of law because they're bound up together. So if you're going to change the order of priesthood, you've got to change the covenant that, that they uh, activate and they uh, employ, right? And so there's going to be a change. And the author of Hebrews is going to explain all of that in chapter 8, 9, and 10 very shortly. And then he says this, for the one about whom these things are said, like, the one about whom it said, you're going to be a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, the Messiah. Psalm 110 is all about the Messiah. It's all about the great king that God is going to send, who's going to sit on God's throne. And not only is he going to be a king, he's also going to be a priest, which is weird because that's not the way it worked in Israel. Kings came from one tribe, priests came from another. But of this one, 
verse 13, for the one about whom these things are spoken in Psalm 110 belongs to another tribe from which no one has ever officiated the, the altar. There was never a priest in Israel from the tribe of Judah. That was the kingly tribe, the royal tribe, not the priestly tribe. Uh, for it is evident that our Lord, Jesus, was descended from Judah, a tribe with reference to which Moses said nothing concerning priests. And then he goes on and says, this is clearer still. If a priest arises after the likeness of Melchizedek, who becomes a priest, not on the base of, basis of physical requirement, in other words, not on uh, family heritage. How did you become a priest in Israel? You, you inherited it. You were part of the right family line. You were from the tribe of Levi. That's how you became a priest. Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. So how did he become a priest? Well, he's a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So who has become a priest, not on the basis of a law of physical requirement, but according to the power of an indestructible life. Like Jesus cannot die. Jesus lives forever. And it's that power that qualified him to be the eternal priest that would actually bring cleansing and completion. And so he quotes here, Psalm, Psalm 110, verse 4, for it's attested of him, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And so he says, for on the one hand, there is the nullification of a former commandment, the old covenant its day is done. Its job is over. It's served its time. And so now it's come to its culmination point, right? Uh, and it did so, it says, because of its, notice these words, weakness and uselessness. When God made the covenant with Israel on Mount Sinai and established the tabernacle and the priesthood and all the ceremonies, right? Right? Maybe. I mean, it was a big day, and there was lots of fanfare, and it was exciting. And on that day, it was basically like being given a form of worship, and maybe they felt, it's all you'll ever need. But it didn't take long for them to realize, and yet, and yet, right? Read the story of Israel, and you'll see they kept failing. They kept sinning. They kept breaking the covenant they were unfaithful to God, more sacrifices, uh, right? More worship. And at some point you begin to realize as you read the prophets, it's like, God, when are you going to actually make our hearts new? We need something different. We need something more. And you get this promise of a new covenant. Why? Because the old covenant was weak and useless. It wasn't bad. It was just kind of preliminary. It was like a 386 SX with four megs of RAM. It's a good place to start, but it's never going to actually bring you into full computing power. And the old covenant was never going to bring you into full, secure, complete relationship with God. It was ineffective for that. It had a purpose, but that was not its purpose to be the final word on the subject of cleansing and completion before God. It was weak and useless. And so he says, for this law made nothing perfect, made nothing clean and complete. But on the other hand, there's the introduction of a better hope, a better hope, a better way of drawing near to God, a better way of relating to God, a better hope through which we come near to God. Notice that, that when Messiah comes, when Jesus comes, and he's put into this, this role as priest after the order of Melchizedek, what do we get? We get a better hope by which we can come near to God completely clean, completely whole, complete, perfect, he says. Not perfect in the sense we never make mistakes, perfect in the sense that our relationship with God now is exactly what God designed it to be, right? Like we are clean and complete before God. And he goes on, verse 20 says, to the extent that it was not without an oath, 
Uh, for they, the Old Testament priests, well, they became priests without an oath. But he, uh, Messiah Jesus, with an oath, through the one who said to him, the Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever. Notice that Psalm 110 actually pronounced it with an oath. The Lord has sworn. He gave an oath. You are going to be it, Messiah. You're going to be the final priest. You're going to be the priest forever. And so by the same extent, since it was made with an oath, Jesus also has become for us a guarantee of a better covenant, a better hope, and a better covenant. What are covenants for? We don't often use the word covenant too often in our culture, right? And we don't certainly use it like they did. Covenants were everywhere in the ancient world. And when you made a covenant in the Old Testament world, you cut a covenant. You didn't make it. You cut a covenant. Why? Because it came with sacrifice. You would make a sacrifice, cut an animal in half, and you basically, that was like signing on the dotted line, signing in your own blood by cutting an animal in half. And what you're saying when you made a covenant under the Old, Old Testament was, you're saying, look, may it be to me if I don't keep my end of this covenant. May it be to you if you don't keep this end of your covenant. What happened to this animal, that's what will happen to you if you don't keep the covenant. As it was cut in half, so will you. Like, covenants then and still now, their primary purpose is to secure a relationship, to put some skin in the game, right? Like, to make it, to make that, let's guarantee this thing. That's what covenants do. Picture it like this. Dating versus marriage. You know, you could date someone and, and you could fall in love and you could really like each other, right? And it could be, feel pretty solid, you know, it doesn't take much to end that relationship. But marriage takes a little more work to end that relationship. There's, there's a covenant involved. There's a contract involved. The law's involved. And if you want to end that relationship, you're going to have to go through some legal processes. Why? That relationship has been way more secured because of a covenant, right? We know this like with contracts, you put down a little bit of earnest money, you sign on a dotted line, it's like, okay, depending on how much you put in, I got some skin in the game. I'm not going to break that because I don't want to lose that money. That's how covenants work. And when it says that Jesus became a guarantee of a better covenant, the old covenant was good to start, but it wasn't the final word. It wasn't all you need. He guarantees a final, full, better covenant. And he did so with his own blood. Not threatening your blood or my blood, but offering his blood and thus securing our relationship with God forever. So the author of Hebrews goes on and says, the former priests, the Levitical priests, on the one hand, they existed in great numbers, right? Like from Moses to Jesus, 1,400 years of priests, right? Coming and going, coming and going, living and dying. 1,400 years of priests in greater numbers. Why? Because they were prevented by death from continuing. They might serve for 30 or 40 years, then they die. Another priest, right? High priest. We got one for a while. Oh, he dies. Next one, right? Now, they were prevented by death from continuing. But Jesus, on the other hand, because he lives forever, he holds his priesthood permanently. And therefore, here, here is the big implication. Therefore, he, Jesus, is also able to save forever. And the word forever means forever, but it also means like to the utmost. Like both in time and in degree, in every way, he's able to rescue and save completely, totally, ultimately, and forever those who come to God through him, since he always lives and will never die, so he can keep making intercession. He can keep praying and asking on your behalf and my behalf. He lives forever. He is a priest forever. He will never die, and therefore he can save completely and totally and forever anyone who comes to God through him. For it was fitting for us to have such a high priest Holy, innocent, undefiled, 
separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. Just think of all those words now applied to Jesus. Holy, innocent, undefiled, separate, not separate in distance, separate in kind. He's not a priest who has to offer sacrifice for his own sins. He's not a priest who's, you know, a sinner just like you and me. He's, he's not separate in distance. He's separate in kind, separate from sinners and exalted above the heavens, who has no daily need like those other high priests to offer up sacrifices for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. He doesn't need to do that because he's totally pure. He's sinless. And so he can offer one sacrifice for all time. Notice, because he did this once for all when he offered up himself. For the law, the old covenant, appoints men as high priests who are weak. But the word of the oath, Psalm 110, the promise of a Messiah who would also be a priest, the word of the oath, which came after the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. Now, um, that's Melchizedek. And let me just... Let me just offer this to you by way of encouragement. When you read this, here's what I know. We look at this story about Jesus or Melchizedek. You need to know that Jesus is your Melchizedek. He is your high priest after Melchizedek. Why does that matter? Well, look at some of the key facts about Jesus. And let's just put them on the screen. He offers a better hope by which you can draw near to God. He secures a better relationship through a better covenant. He, he does so by the power of an indestructible life. He's never going to die, right? Uh, it's a permanent priesthood, therefore. He always lives to pray for you, to intercede on your behalf, to, to help you. Um, he's holy, innocent, undefiled. He's exalted above the heavens. One final, ultimate sacrifice, and it's done. And therefore, he saves completely and forever anyone who puts their faith in him. Now, I've been a pastor long enough to know that I've, I've sat with people who are older uh, saints. They've walked with God for a while, right? Um, and they're feeling the weight of their mortality. And they know they don't have a whole lot of time left. And I've heard them say, um, in that moment, I sure, I sure hope he can save me. And what Melchizedek says, right, when we realize Jesus is our Melchizedek, it says, we don't need to wonder and we don't need to be insecure. He can save forever and completely those who come to God through him. I've also sat with people who are new on their faith journey. They're just beginning to figure it out. They're just kind of trying out their first careful, cautious step towards maybe walking with God and following Jesus. And, and they're like, I, I don't know if God could ever love me. I don't know if God could ever welcome me or receive me. And what Jesus as our Melchizedek says is, wait a second, wait a second. He brought perfect cleansing, perfect cleansing, complete cleansing. He can welcome you. So whether you're getting towards the end of your earthly walk with Jesus or whether you're right at the very beginning of your walk with Jesus, knowing that Jesus is your priest after the order of Melchizedek means you know that your relationship with God is completely secure, completely secure. Not because you're so good or you're so great or you're so perfect or you're so wonderful, but because Jesus, because Jesus lives forever to make intercession for you. That's why. And he'll welcome you just where you're at and then he'll clean you up along the way so that you become increasingly what God made you. To be. And that's why Melchizedek matters. That's why you need to know about him, right? It, it may seem like this tedious, technical, little biblical argument, but it matters because you want to walk with God and you want to know, guess what? He brought perfect cleansing. I'm clean. I'm complete. I am whole because of what God did for me in Jesus.